if the mic will cooperate, we'll get started here. Welcome back to the 2022-3 school year. It's an exciting time to think about school being right on the horizon. First off today, we would like to start this morning recognizing Lisa Gerstacker and Bill Schutte from the Gerstacker family, who have been wonderful educational partners to Midland Public Schools for many years and have made the Gerstacker and DSA awards possible through their generosity. I don't believe either were able to make it today, but we still would like to recognize them. So thank you for the Gerstacker fam, if we give them a hand. We would also like to recognize our Board of Education trustees who so generously volunteered so many hours to serve our school district. Here with us today is President Scott McFarland, <laughs> Vice President Phil Rausch is somewhere around here, you may have seen him, <laughs> Treasurer John Lauterbach is also with us today. Secretary John Hatfield, Trustees Lynn Bag Baker, Brad Blasey, and Patrick Rizzee are out doing their jobs today. So thank, thank you, those as well. Our veteran staff members know that one of my favorite things in life beyond my family and my field, in the field of education is baseball. They also know that my opening staff meetings for nine years had many comments, always including baseball quotes and metaphors. However, this year I'm going to throw you a curveball and start with a quote by head football coach Jacksonville Jaguars Doug Pedersen, who said, an individual can make a difference, but a team can make a miracle. As we begin the 22-23 opening staff meeting, I would like all of us to keep two important things in mind. The Midland Public Schools team, the unifying goal is educational excellence for 7,600 students. The MPS vision statement, lead with respect, trust, and courage. Ensure an equitable, collaborative, and inclusive culture. Enable all to achieve success. When I reflect on my past nine years with Midland Public Schools, I look back at a district that has achieved many successes and accomplishments. Approximately 6,000 MPS students have graduated. Hundreds of student academic, athletic, CTE, music, and art awards have been earned. Our standardized assessment averages surpass peers from across the state year after year. We are state leader in innovative programming to meet student needs. We have significantly improved our learning facilities. We have stabilized our student enrollment. We, have we are financially strong, which allows our resources to put, be put into the learning and supports in the classroom. We have a board of education that recognizes our employees are key to our success and provided year after year compensation and benefit increases and other supports. We know MPS student success are reflective of the administrator, teacher, sponsors, coaches, and support staff influencers that they've had throughout their elementary, middle, and high school career. I must agree with Mr. Pedersen when I speak about MPS. Our individual staff members make a profound difference. But our United District working together can make a miracle in the lives of students. Here's another thought I'd like us to reflect on this morning. During my nine years, I've heard the terms us and them bandied about often by various staff members. I've learned in my nine years that us and them means staff members in the school versus staff members downtown at the administration center. I know these terms were used long before I arrived. However, I would challenge all of us to think of our district as one big, United Midland Public Schools team and not us and them. I have played on and coached many, many sports teams in my life and unequivocally the most successful teams are those united toward one common goal. In the case of Midland Public Schools, we can all agree our common goal is the educational excellence of our 7,600 students. A long, long time ago, baseball great Lou Gehrig said, there's no room in baseball for discrimination. It is our national pastime and a game for all. <clears throat> our district has made diversity, equity, and inclusion a major emphasis for the past several years and is a driving force in the Middle Public Schools vision statement. 
In the July of 2020, I issued a call to action for all students, staff, and families to identify injustices in our schools and to take action. That call to action is still in effect and includes injustice towards any students or staff within Midland Public Schools. I agree with Mr. Garrick's thought when it comes to Midland Public Schools is a district for all. I know we are starting a new school year with a bouquet of sharpened pencils and, and pencil caddies on our desk and are ready to tackle all the challenges in front of us. I also know that public education today can be tough and we ask so much of our educators to support staff members. We can get tired and weary. But in the words of the St. Louis Cardinals manager, Whitey Herzog, play smart and have some laughs along the way. Remember, you're not in, you are not in this alone. Take time to laugh and chat with those around you. Your colleagues are a great source of support and laughter. I'd like to close my comments today with a few words by the late, great Joe DiMaggio. You always get a special kick on opening day, no matter how many you go through. You look forward to it like a birthday party when you're a kid. You think something wonderful is going to happen. That's how I still think about the first day of school even though this is my 39th year in as an educator. I just know something wonderful is going to happen this year. Thank you for sharing your passion for your education, your patience, and your spirit. And of course, we can't start a new school year without the words, play ball, let's all swing for the fences during the 22-23 school year. Thank you. At this time, I would like to introduce Katie Bell Pearson, the Corporate Relations Manager of United Way of Midland County. Katie will spend just a couple of moments to give us some details about our 22 Midland Public Schools United Way campaign. Welcome, Katie. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me this morning. I'm Katie Bell Pierce. I'm the Corporate Relationship Manager at United Way of Midland County. As the daughter of an educator who dedicated 32 years, to her, 32 years of her life to teaching, I know and value the importance of education and positive adult mentors. As educators, you show up every day for our students and families, teaching, caring for, and encouraging success. But at times, our kids need more. A positive adult model or mentor, a tutor to help them catch up, or even a safe place to share their struggles. As a child who overcame a learning disability, my tutor, Mrs. Holly, is someone that I would never forget. I, sorry, I always get emotional when I talk about Mrs. Holly. As you guys know, um, with the students that, uh, that you impact, that, that stays with you. So um, she was the first person to really take special interest in me. And she put me on the path to be successful at reading. That's what programs like the ones offered at the Legacy Center, Big Brothers Big Sisters, ESA, The Rock, our local community centers do and more. They pour into our kids outside of the classroom to ensure they have the right care and the support that they need. I have so much respect and admiration for all of you. It brings me great pride to work alongside you towards our collective goals we share in the community. The mental health of our youth is worsening. 34% of young females and 18% of youth males report struggling with depression. That is an increase of 11% since 2016 in youths reporting depression. Your investment in United Way means that programs are here to help our kids healthy ways to help teach our kids healthy ways to cope. They need people they can trust and talk to about the struggles they are facing. United Way has a goal of 4.7 million for this year's campaign. Midland Public Schools is aiming to raise 20,000. We may never get a chance to meet the people whose lives we've changed but know they are forever grateful that someone like Mrs. Holly was there at a time they needed our support. Thank you. Thank you, Katie.
together, MPS, let's make this a banner year for our United Way program. I am now excited to get the DSA portion of our opening meeting underway. The MPS Board of Education established the Distinguished Service Awards in 2002. The board acknowledges the valuable contributions made by its sports staff in providing excellent education for all students. A quality educational system can occur only when every employee group works together to provide the welfare for our students and to the community it serves. Each year, four very deserving support staff members are awarded the DSA. Without further delay, our DSA awards. Good morning, Midland Public School staff. My name is Kara Stark, and I am the principal at Central Park Elementary. I have the honor to announce one of the 2022 Distinguished Service Award recipients and share some of the amazing things that this recipient's colleagues mentioned that highlight why this individual is deserving of the award. This individual's colleagues said she goes above and beyond her job descriptions on a daily basis. She spends countless hours volunteering her time over the summer to prepare for a successful start to the school year. Her warm and friendly face, paired with her calm and sweet demeanor, is inviting and makes people feel welcome the minute they walk in the door. No matter what comes her way, in work or personal life, she approaches things with a glass half full kind of attitude. Her resilient, positive, kind and caring attitude are just a few of the wonderful characteristics of this individual that makes her an asset to Central Park. Her humble personality and willingness to learn new things is notable. When you are around this individual, her smile is contagious and you can't help but smile along with her. I can attest to each and every one of these qualities about this recipient. She is more than deserving of this award. This individual joined the MPS team in 2013 as a paraprofessional at Eastlawn Elementary. In 2016, she moved to Central Park to work with the Explorers in her role as a paraprofessional. At the time of her DSA nomination, this Hope College graduate was an office paraprofessional at Central Park. However, we are excited to report that she was promoted to the position of administrative assistant at Central Park Elementary this summer. This humble individual's positive rapport with staff, students, and families at CPE and the kindness shown to everyone she encounters has made her an asset to MPS. Midland Public Schools is lucky to have this employee as part of our school community. Please help me congratulate the 2022 Distinguished Service Award recipient, Amy Crowley. Congratulations, Amy. Kara, you got a post of the picture, oh. you know? Good morning. I'm Mike Muggerberg, the Director of Facilities and Operations. I'd like to start out by reading a letter that this recipient's previous supervisor wrote on June 28th, right before retiring. Most of you here don't even know her. This person's work ethic, compassion, and dedication for MPS and others is outstanding. Her ability to get the job done from driving a bus on a minute's notice to running the transportation department from 5 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. just to save Mike Muggenberg. When the managers, managers were sick, it's second to none. 
Her sense of humor to keep things light is great, like using the signal, call, call, or putting jingle bells on the door handle so we would know when the boss is coming. She's always willing to go the extra mile in everything that she does. I can't think of anyone who is more deserving of this award. Vicki Benny. I know Vicki was very proud of her, and I can see why. I can hear the compassion she has for the students that ride Midland Public Schools buses by the tone of her voice. From the ex excitement you hear when she's able to help out a parent with a transportation issue and saying to me, we got this, don't worry. To the disappointment in her voice saying, what we do for one, we do for all. It stinks, I know. It seemed to be every morning for a while that when I s slowly opened the back office door to try to sneak past her bells hanging on the door, I would not hear the call, call warning sign. She was running another route. She is definitely a great asset to Midland Public Schools. And nothing showed that more than when we were down two out of the three ladies that run the office, leaving just her. From 5 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., she was answering bus driver's questions, answering the phones, answering the radio, listening to me ask, how are you feeling? And keeping everyone and everything running. Even during this time, she was joking and upbeat. I'm sure she's figured out early on who I am talking about and is not very happy with me or Angie. Since it is also opening day for the bus drivers and it's her first opening day as a manager of transportation, I am sure we had to trick her to get her over here. And Right now, I'm hoping I'm not sitting too close to her. I would like to introduce to you, Leslie Gold. Thank you, Leslie. Good morning. With the mission of the Midland Public Schools serving as its focus, the Board of Education acknowledges the valuable contributions made by its support staff in providing an excellent education for our students. A quality educational system can only occur when every employee group works together to promote the welfare of the students in the community it serves. To further recognize the effort put forth by members of our support staff, the Midland Public Schools Board of Education has established the Distinguished Service Award. These Distinguished Service Awards are made possible through the generosity of the Rollin M. Gerstacker Foundation. As the proud principal of Chestnut Hill Elementary School, it is my honor to be announcing one of the Distinguished Service Award winners as a member of the amazing staff at Chestnut Hill Elementary. On any given school day, there are many adults working to support student learning. Students may work with teachers, related service providers, and classroom volunteers. They may also receive support from a paraprofessional. Paraprofessionals work alongside and under the direction of a certified teacher or school professional, providing instructional, behavioral, and other support to students in and outside of the classroom. Some paraprofessionals work with students in a special education classroom, while others may work with students in a general education classroom or rotate to support all classes in a specific grade level. Not only do paraprofessionals provide many supports to students and staff, they also supervise students before and after school, in the lunchroom, and during lunch recess. 
However, the most important thing paraprofessionals do is make connections and build strong relationships with the students they work with, which helps those students to feel safe, connected, and successful in the school setting. The award winner I will announce today does all of those things and is excellent at building relationships with all students, not just those she specifically works with. <clears throat> and she is a well-respected team player of the Chestnut Hill community. This award winner received many nominations, which included the following comments. She is a go-getter. She is hardworking and willing to step into any role needed of her. She is flexible. She covers in the office. She takes on any grade level at lunch or lunch recess. She covers the library when needed, and she will fill in as a teacher sub at a moment's notice. She works one-on-one -on -one with a student and works hard to support that student's needs while pushing the student to be as independent as possible. I have witnessed her go the extra mile to encourage this particular student to be the best that she can be. Another nomination included the following. She is a worker bee and constantly looking to help in any way needed. Additionally, she is always looking to learn and continue developing her skill set. She is eager to meet with staff outside of school hours in order to better support the students she works with. She not only builds positive relationships with staff, but students and our Chestnut Hill families as well. She is a rock star. I have worked with her for eight years here at Chestnut Hill, and she is always willing to step in and cover for anyone that is absent. When she is doing lunch duty with fifth graders, which she does fifth grade every year, she is so passionate with her job. She gets to know the students and listens to all of them before trying to handle a situation. She is a caring person to work with. A final nomination included, she is a wonderful person. She always goes above and beyond for our students. She is quick to help others wherever she is needed. She has also been a huge influence and mentor for myself as well. She is most definitely deserving of this award. It is my pleasure to announce Mary Hamilton as a Distinguished Service Award winner for Midland Public Schools. Congratulations, Mary. Good morning, everyone. This Distinguished Service Award recipient comes from the Technology Department. He has been with Midland Public Schools for 14 years, starting as a workstation technician in 2008. That's the same year that he earned his bachelor's degree from Davenport University. This team member has been a fixture on the help desk and is well known for providing excellent customer service. In 2011, this team member earned his CompTIA A plus certification. The A plus certification is a globally recognized standard for demonstrating excellent computer knowledge and customer service skills. Since then, he has spent the intervening years developing his technical skills and providing great customer support experiences for all of our stakeholders. This year, he has taken over the role of support specialist. In the technology department, the support specialist is the team lead responsible for managing the technicians and processes that provide the first line of customer support to all staff, students, and parents for everything and anything that is technology related. By now, I'm guessing you may have figured out that this recipient is none other than our own Eric Smith. Eric was recommended for this award by other staff members because of his positive, calm, patient demeanor. He is known for his ability to ensure education continues uninterrupted regardless of the size of the classroom or the number of students in it. Eric always arrives at a building with a smile on his face regardless of the conditions of the reason for being there. He always comes across as genuinely happy to be doing his job. Please join me in congratulating Eric Smith on this wonderful accomplishment and on achieving this milestone in his career. Thank you. We are now ready for the 20, 
2022 Gerstecker Excellence in Teaching Awards. We are so excited to reveal and celebrate our Gerstecker Awards with everyone at our opening meeting for the very first time. Please welcome MPS teacher and MCA president, Mark Hackbarth, to the stage to get our Gerstecker Awards underway. Good morning. Um, over the past few years, there's been a lot of changes, right? We've gone back and forth between in-person and virtual learning. Uh, wearing masks, not wearing masks, Google Classroom to Canvas, Teacher Access Center, Center to Synergy, the Detroit Lions being terrible to winning a Super No, that didn't happen. <laughs> um, and, and for this school year, the addition of over 40 new hires joining the MPS family. But one thing that has remained constant over the years has been the Gerstacker Excellence in Teaching Award an award that's given each year to four amazing MPS educators. This year is no exception. The Gerstacker Excellence in Teaching Award, which is sponsored by the Carl and Esther Gerstacker Donor Advised Fund, began in 1956 and is widely recognized in our community as the most prestigious honor given to a professional educator. Near the end of last school year, nominations were collected from parents, fellow educators, and students. Over the summer, the Gerstacker Committee met to select this year's winners. I would like to take a moment to thank the Gerstacker family for their continued support without which this award would not be possible. I would also like to thank the Gerstacker Award Committee, Board of Education member John Lauterbach, MPS Administrator Dirk DeBoer, 2021 Award recipient Jeff Yoder, and the MCA Professional Standards Chair Amy Guzman. A special thank you goes to the Executive Secretary Megan Feiss and recent retiree Cindy Young for the behind the scenes work that helps to make this all happen. It's now time to reveal the first of this year's Gerstacker Excellence in Teaching Award winners. We will begin with a video introduction of our first recipient. Teachers are the true heroes. As principal of Adams Elementary, it is my considerable privilege to observe our teachers lead in their classes and to support them in their work. Being a great teacher requires an extensive content knowledge and the mastery of a myriad of skills. More importantly, however, great teachers connect with their students, use the psychology and science of teaching and learning, and truly understand where their the students are and what they need to be successful. It is a science and an art. Watching a master teacher at work is a true joy. I'd like to thank the Gerstacker family for joining us today. We appreciate your support of MPS teachers in general and this Adams teacher specifically. Visiting this teacher's classroom, you will notice the many hallmarks of excellence in teaching. She is with her students, really with them. In fact, her students are with her. They flock around her, seek her approval, and aim to reach the bar that she has set. She understands her students at their level. She looks them in the eye, listens, understands, and leads. She has mastered her class content. She is a clear, consistent communicator with her students, with their families, and with the rest of the Adams staff. She is a great mentor. She's a true leader on a grade level team. She tirelessly provides support for her teammates, providing lessons and materials, answering questions, and being a sounding board for them. She supports and lifts up her teammates. Most of all, she is caring. She connects before she corrects. She creates a safe environment that allows her students to take risks, to grow, to succeed. Now, what do parents and colleagues and others say about this teacher? Here are some comments that were provided to us. She is the epitome of a great teacher. She instills confidence in all of her students. Her students know that she believes in them. She is one of the most prepared teachers I've ever worked with. She forms strong relationships with her students and she shows them through her kind words and actions that she loves them and cares about them as people. When you walk by her room, you will see laughter, smiles, and a lot of learning taking place. Now, how did she get here today? This teacher is a Midland High graduate. She earned her bachelor's in elementary teaching from Indiana University and her master's from Saginaw Valley State. She taught for two years in Illinois before returning to Midland, and after 10 years at Chippewassee, she is now entering her 23rd year at Adams Elementary. Through that time, she has taught second and fourth grade, even a year of kindergarten, but mostly more, for more than a decade now, she has been a rock in the third grade team here at Adams Elementary. 
Sally Harvey, her supervising teacher when Beth was doing her student teaching, said this, Beth is a joy to have in charge of the classroom. Adjectives that describe Beth are animated, expressive, dramatic, positive, firm, encouraging, creative, and humorous. Beth is firm, yet loving. Whoever hires this young woman will be getting a gem. Well, Sally, you are correct. We did get a gem in Beth Curtis. In Beth's application to MPS, she stated that she wanted to be an influential role model to establish a positive classroom environment and to teach students creatively. Beth, you continue to do that every day. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my extreme privilege and high honor to introduce to you the winner of the Gerstecker Award for Excellence in Elementary Teaching, Beth Curtis. I have the distinct privilege of announcing a Gerstacker Award recipient from our secondary special education team. This individual joined MPS 19 years ago and has been an incredible asset to the district ever since. If you were to walk into her classroom in the morning, the best way to describe it is like a well-managed beehive of activity. This is largely because she works tirelessly behind the scenes to make sure the staff and students in her classroom are put in positions to be successful. She embodies what it means to be a special education teacher with an emphasis on individual growth and meeting the needs of each unique learner to help them achieve their own greatest potential. She empowers the young adults she works with to become contributing members of the community, all while building genuine relationships that go beyond the classroom. It is clear to see that she truly cares about the students and families she works with. I personally have had a chance to work with this individual as a paraprofessional, teaching colleague, and administrator. I can definitively say that she is genuine to the core in her compassion and care for teaching students with exceptional needs. When asked their thoughts on this individual, one staff member noted, this person takes high school graduates with exceptional needs, sprinkles her adult magic on them, and turns them into contributing, productive members of the community. She gives her students the perfect mix of tough love, realistic expectations, and a little push in the right direction. Another staff member noted, I've had the opportunity of getting to know this person over the past five years while working at HH Dow High. It has been such a benefit to me to have her as one of my mentors as she does an outstanding job when working with students with special needs. The post-secondary program that Lori Hedrick has overseen for many years is hands down one of the best in the state of Michigan. And her student success is evident of her hard work and dedication. There have been many times I have reached out to Lori for assistance and she has never hesitated to lend a helping hand. She sets the bar high for herself and for her students and is such an asset to her program, school, and community. Her leadership is appreciated on many levels including that of her paraprofessionals and parents, where she encourages all members to play an active role. Lori rallies for all of her students and goes above and beyond to make sure that their experience while in her program is exceptional. The high praise that Lori is given from her colleagues is matched by the appreciation shared from the students and parents that she works with. She's an amazing asset to Midland Public Schools and the community. Lori Hedrick exemplifies what it means to be a Gerstacker Award recipient through her daily dedication to the craft of teaching and support of students with exceptional learning needs, both within the walls of her classroom and beyond. 
I am honored to be able to recognize Lori Hedrick as a Gerstacker Award recipient. Congratulations, Lori. Lori is Lori's actually unable to be with us today. Um, she is viewing from home though, and so I know she feels the love that you're sending her um, as she watches from home. So Lori, I apologize for the small white lie I had to tell you to get you to tune in from home. Um, but congratulations and uh, very deserved, so thank you. Good morning, Midland Public Schools. I'm Shannon Blazy, principal of Jefferson Middle School. I have the honor today of introducing one of this year's Gerstacker Teaching and Excellent Award winners. I am going to share some special words that help describe our Gerstacker winner. This teacher really likes her words. Our first word of the day is supportive. Supportive means to provide sympathy or encouragement or to provide additional help or information. Parents describe this Gerstacker winner as supportive to her students. This winner is more than happy to assist students with anything they need and encourages students to never give up. Our next word of the day is exceptional. This means that she is unusually excellent or superior. This Gerstacker winner is described by her colleagues as exceptional, offering materials and supplies to fellow teachers giving encouraging words and assisting with anything to make Jefferson a better place for our students and staff. The next word of the day is inspire. This means to fill someone with the urge or ability to do something, especially to do something creative. This teacher inspires students to find the books that light the love of reading within them. She not only has a library of her own in which students can choose their books, but she had her own student book club build an officially registered little library that is mobile at our school. Our next word of the day is grandiose, impressive and imposing in appearance or style, especially pretentiously so. Our Gerstacker winner does not like grandiose presentations about herself, but she does enjoy the pomp and circumstance of royalty. She was once referred to last year as the queen. And your highness, your crown will be on your desk upon your return to school. Our Gerstacker winner is also meticulous, showing great attention to detail and very careful and precise. Our Gerstacker winner also meticulously works with her students on teaching them daily vocabulary. These words and hundreds of other literary elements of speech are shared by our teacher to her students to broaden their vocabulary and therefore to help them connect them to the world around them. Our Gerstacker winner has meticulously worked on her craft of teaching English. After beginning her career at Muskegon and Mount Pleasant schools, she joined MPS in 1996 as an English teacher at Northeast Intermediate School. In 1997, she transferred to Jefferson Middle School where she continues her teaching career today as our new learning coach. And our last word of the day is prestigious. And the winner of the prestigious Gerstacker Excellence in Teaching Award is Tanya Lambert. Congratulations, Tanya. Hello Team MPS, I'm pleased to share that the next recipient of a Gerstacker Award comes from Woodcrest Elementary. 
Similar to all of the district schools, we are fortunate to have an outstanding team at Woodcrest that is comprised of strong, dedicated, and passionate educators. This year's recipient exemplifies all of those qualities and more. She has been a key member of our team for more than 20 years and has exemplified excellence throughout her career as an educator that currently spans nearly 30 years. Our next recipient is regarded as great by colleagues, students, and parents. The online edition of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines the word great as, quote, an outstandingly superior or skillful person. Google defines the word great as, quote, of an extent, amount, or intensity, considerably above the normal or average. While I agree with both of these definitions, I would also add that greatness is achieved by consistently demonstrating exceptionally high levels of performance over a considerable length of time. Great sports stars, entertainers, and companies are not referred to or thought of as great because they had a good game, a good season, or a good year. In our society, greatness comes with being able to produce exceptional results on a consistent basis for a lengthy period of time. The reason for this threshold is that the term great is used to reflect respect and admiration for individuals and organizations that have demonstrated the ability to display the skill and dogged determination it takes to adapt, persevere, and overcome the ever-changing variables and conditions that time and life present with remarkable consistency. During her career with Midland Public Schools, our next recipient has served as a special education teacher at Midland High and a resource room teacher, second grade teacher, and first grade teacher at Woodcrest. In all of these capacities, our next recipient has demonstrated the ability and outstanding skill at carrying out her craft and helping students of all ability levels to grow and be their best. Although she last worked at Midland High as a special education teacher over 20 years ago, from time to time, I will run into colleagues who worked with her in that role and they invariably say, she was a great teacher, I loved working with her. I can attest to the authenticity of those comments because Jackie McGee has done an outstanding job in the 20 plus years that she has been on our team at Woodcrest. When she served as our resource room teacher, she did an outstanding job. When she moved to second grade, she did an outstanding job. And the same can be said for her current role as a first grade teacher at our school. In all of these capacities, her teaching skills, ability to connect with students, and ability to make a difference for her students was and is exceptional. To lend as much credibility as possible to the comments I have shared thus far, it would be prudent to share that parent nominations included comments such as the following, quote, Jackie is an exceptional teacher. When you enter her classroom, you can immediately feel the energy and passion she exudes for teaching and for her students. Families who have had her in the past or currently have her always comment on how wonderful she is and how she is their favorite teacher of all time. Another parent commented, Mrs. McGee is highly deserving of the Gerstacker Excellence in Teaching Award. She is dedicated and caring, takes an interest in each of her students, and most importantly, she gets them excited about learning. We are very lucky to have both of our kids in her classroom. For good measure, a colleague added, quote, Jackie is the gold standard. She is simply awesome at what she does. While another added, I have learned so much from her. She is as good as it gets. Congratulations, Jackie. You are very deserving of this re recognition. You are great at what you do, and we are grateful for calling our team in the Trust.
I think back nine years ago to our first um, opening day and what we do today with the recognition of our staff and with the family there, it's just a highlight. It's a special moment for sure. Um, so Jamie, you've got to follow all that up today. So a little introduction of our guest speaker today. Jamie Vollmer is a defender and promoter of public education. He works to increase trust in American public schools and build support for the millions of educators who work to ensure student success. Jamie is the author of the book, Schools Cannot Do It Alone, proclaimed by the American School Board Journal to be one of the top 10 books of the year. He received the Learning and Liberty Award from the National Public School Relations Association in recognition of his success in strengthening school community relationships. With a background in law and manufacturing, Mr. Vollmer entered the education arena in 1988 as a founding member of the Iowa Business Roundtable. At that time, he was the president of the Great Midwestern Ice Cream Company, declared by People Magazine to make the best ice cream in America. Once a harsh critic of American public schools, over the last 30 years, he has become an articulate champion working with educators, parents, businesses, and community leaders to move the obstacles to student success. Mr. Vollmer holds a Juris Doctor from Catholic University and a BA from Penn State. He is married to his college sweetheart, they have three grown children who they love, but they love their granddaughters way more. <laughs> Floor is yours, Jamie. When was I here last? Um, I'm going to say four years ago. It's got to be more. And how long do you want this to go? As long as you want. Okay. Okay, great. Hi, folks. Um, I'm going to ask you to start out by doing this. Um, I know, I've been doing this a long time, I know some of you A-types have been here since 6.30 this morning. Why doesn't everybody just stand up and stretch for a minute? So, a couple of introductory comments. Uh, I do these all over the country, but this is the first one for this calendar year. It's also the first time I've worn regular shoes in weeks and weeks. Uh, I just spent most of the last month with those two darling granddaughters. So it's going to take me a little while to become Jamie Vollmer, so-called expert, as opposed to Poppy. <laughs> I won't tell you which is more fun. <laughs> and I want to ask, how many people were here the last time I spoke? Raise your hands. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, how many people have no idea who I am? Raise your hands. Yeah, that's about right. So since it's been a little while, uh, what's new? <laughs> you know, I know you won't, even those who are here won't remember this. Um, I have, I'm not from here, obviously. I have very strong associations with the state of Michigan. Um, this Thanksgiving, I will have kissed my wife for the very first time uh, 52 years ago in a, on a cabin above Grayling, so. <laughs> always feel great. Um, things are changing in Michigan. Things are a little bit different than they used to be. Um, what I want to talk about is not your curriculum or assessment, uh, I have opinions, um, or instruction so that you all know you're not getting anything that will help you reconstruct your bulletin boards at the elementary level. This is going to be about one thing. This is about your relationship with the people of the greater Midland area. That's all this is. Uh, Mike was kind enough to mention a book that I wrote, and the title pretty much says it all. Schools, you can put your name in there, schools cannot do it alone. You some of you think you can. Some of you think 
if they would just leave me alone. And you're referring to your principal. If you would just leave me alone, let me do what I know how to do. Um, I know you're very good at what you do. You can't do it by yourself. I'm going to start this out a little differently, which is always a little bit of a <laughs> dicey moment. This is a list that I've been creating for 30 years. This list started out as an eight and a half by 11 trifold piece of paper, and it just continues to expand. So this was the 2021 edition. I have yet to update it. Once upon a time, your long past predecessors were asked to teach a small handful of primarily privileged white boys a tiny, tiny little curriculum, a little civics, a little history, a little reading, writing, and arithmetic. That went on for a very long time. But then, starting in the early part of the 20th century, we began to add things. So from 1900 to 1910, I won't read the whole list. From 1900 to 1910, we added things like lessons in basic hygiene, courses in nutrition. We started immunizing kids at school. Oh, there's a hot button. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? Screening for vision, hearing, and dental problems. That's the first decade of the 20th century. And then we're off. From 1910 to 1940, we had vocational education, including industrial arts and ag ed, domestic science, home ec, including sewing and cooking, phys eds expanded, including a growing number of team sports, not that that's important. We add school transportation is mandated. Now think about that. For generations, kids had to get to school on their own. Now you gotta go fetch them. <laughs> In the 40s, business education, typing, shorthand, bookkeeping, music and arts expanded, speech including drama. Half day kindergartens are introduced, well that's new. School lunch programs, now we have to feed them. In the 50s, science and math are expanded in response to Sputnik, foreign language requirements are strengthened, fire, tornado, duck and cover drills become compulsory. I'm sorry to say I can remember those. Driver's ed is offered, sex education is introduced. I don't know why they can't learn that someplace else, but head start. <laughs> Bilingual, advanced placement, adult education, consumer education, career education, peace studies, and recreation education. God bless those 60s. In the 70s, special ed. There's a line item in your budget. Drug and alcohol abuse education, parenting education, alternative education, I'm skipping. In the 80s, keyboarding and computer education, sexual abuse prevention education, stranger danger education, anti-smoking education, abstinence education, I'm skipping, I'm skipping, I'm skipping. Jump start, early start, even start, prime start, full day kindergartens, after school programs. In the 90s, computer labs, internet instruction, tech prep, school to work, distance learning, I'm skipping, I'm skipping, uh, service learning programs, technical adequate Adequacy, adequacy assessment, dropout prevention programs. In the 2000s, no child left behind is how we started the century. Not that that caused any problems. <laughs> Bullying prevention programs, elevator and escalator safety instruction in some cities. That's true, that's true. Body mass index evaluation, eating disorder counseling, suicide awareness, steroid abuse. I'm skipping, I'm skipping, I'm skipping, I'm skipping, I'm skipping. Race to the top, the common core. <laughs> STEM, allergic reaction monitoring, critical incident training, summer breakfast and lunch programs, courses on internet safety, date rape, organ donor awareness, texting and social media etiquette. Abandoned Newborn Protection Act, trial trafficking, domestic violence, opiate addiction, distracted driving prevention, anger management, and responding to the COVID pandemic. And we have not added a single minute to the school calendar in eight decades. This does not say, teach my child. This says, raise my kid. That's what this list says. 
Every single year we add more. As a matter of fact, I encountered, not that long ago, I encountered a member of your Senate Education Committee and showed him this list, and he said, interesting list. Want me to tell you what we're gonna add this year? <laughs> you can't do it alone. It's impossible. You need the community to support you in many, many ways. Now, I believe that you're the most important group of professionals in Midland. You're more important than doctors, accountants, engineers, certainly more important than lawyers, and I happen to be one of those. You're, you're more important than all of those people to the health, well-being, and the future of Midland. And in an enlightened society, you would be treated and compensated accordingly. But, but I didn't always believe this. For, so for some of you who are here the last time, this may be a bit of a review, but it's important. Excuse me. <coughs> I got into this in a funny way. Uh, your superintendent mentioned that once upon a time I was a critic. Well, I was running in my adopted state of Iowa, and it's okay with me if the Spartans and Big Blue crush the Hawkeyes thoroughly and trounce them so that they never wanna play you again. That is okay with me, because I look forward to the day in October when Penn State comes into the big house and annihilates you. <laughs> I know how to win, friends. <laughs> I was minding my own business and I was running this ice cream company. My, my, Mike mentioned it in passing. We made good ice cream. We knew we made good ice cream, but then in 1984, People Magazine, <laughs> that fine research periodical, <laughs> people decided they needed to know what the best ice cream in America was, so they chose our product. June 84, you can look it up. Great Midwestern ice cream, best ice cream in America. Now, if you ever had any doubt that the media has a tendency to run in a herd, that somebody reports it and they all have to report it, about a month later, the Cleveland Plain Dealer said we were the best ice cream in America. And then the snowball started to roll. The Houston paper, the Seattle paper, the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania paper. We were in Time, we were in Newsweek, we were on the Today Show President Reagan served it in the White House. There was even an anatomy magazine that picked us as the best ice cream in America. It's true, it's called Playboy. And the... <laughs> a little early in the morning for that joke, I guess, but... <laughs> because of all that press, I'm standing here today. That's the truth. I, I wish it was because of my commitment to, to America's kids. It's not. I got all this press, and I began to get invited to do stuff. And one of the things I got invited to do was to be part of this group of business leaders. Again, we're talking 1988 this took place. Long time. Business leaders talking about the future of public education. I agreed to join the group, and I was not a fan. I went to public school. I have good education from public school. But over the years, I've been susceptible, and this is a little, for the English teachers in the room, a little dramatic foreshadowing. I was susceptible to what politicians said, to what the media said, to what my professional journals said. I was susceptible to all the background noise which basically said, you suck. That's true. It grinds you down after a while when you constantly hear this story. I'm gonna talk about stories here. So when I show up for the first Iowa Business Roundtable meeting back in the day, I have an attitude. And the attitude is based on a couple of assumptions. And the first one was, something has to change. We're not getting the kind of graduates that we need. That's the rhetoric. The second assumption I had is if you would just run it like a business, everything would be okay. And the third assumption that I had is you are the problem. Come on, 
you're all hunkered down with tenure, you're all protected in this monopolistic bureaucracy, you're all change averse, you are the problem. So I showed up with that attitude. And curiously enough, I had not met a single other person on that committee prior to that first day. And in 15 minutes, all the business people in this group, we bonded. Why? We all had the same three assumptions. So I kind of got involved and I started joining subcommittees. I thought it was pretty interesting. And after about 18 months, I quit my job at the ice cream company and I became executive director of the Iowa Business Roundtable. And now I had a platform from which to pontificate and I did with a vengeance. So I traveled all over the state, given the gospel according to me. The system needs to change. Those people are the problem. And if they just did it like we did it. Now, you probably won't be surprised to learn that no educators wanted to hear me. <laughs> but after I'd been doing this for a while, I got a phone call on the, like the first or second day of the Christmas break of 1990. So we're going into 1991. I know it's a long time. Please don't tell me you weren't born. Just don't. <laughs> Some of you were not. Don't tell me. No, worse, don't tell me your parents weren't born. <laughs> so, on that phone call, it came from a small western Iowa school district, uh, actually the town that Donna Reed grew up in, and uh, the superintendent from Denison, Iowa, called me up and he said, I'd love you to come and give an in-service. I didn't even know what an in-service was. He said, I'd love you to come and give an in-service. Um, it's this date and you'll have 40 minutes. And I thought, yes, now I'm gonna get to tell you what's up. Now think about it. He invited me, I had no idea what I was walking into. He invited me to give an in-service on the first day back after the Christmas break. It was a late start, so the kids weren't coming until after lunch. So you would have had all morning long to kind of get back in the saddle and get ready, but no. You got to come into the auditorium to listen to me. <coughs> I'm sitting on the stage, and it's an ancient little high school. And with ever 20, 10 or 20 more kids that come in, I mean, more teachers and support staff that come in, the temperature drops another 15 degrees. Icy rage permeates this room. They are so angry that this is how it's all going to go. Because my reputation has preceded me. The local paper had an article about me. So I'm sitting there and I'm watching everybody come in. And you can feel <laughs> negative vibes. The principal, not the superintendent, the principal comes out of the high school and says, Good morning. This here is Mr. Vollmer. He's come from a business group in the state capitol to tell us how to run our schools, and he walked off the stage. <laughs> That's true. So I didn't care. I was, felt like I knew what I was doing, and I got up and I start giving my speech. What's the matter with you people? If I ran my business the way you people operate your schools, I wouldn't be in business for very long. Teachers, you all cloak yourselves in tenure. Administrators, you shield yourselves behind the monopolistic bureaucracy. And you and the board collude to use the rules and regulations that those hoodlums in Lansing think up in the middle of the night to vex you. You use those rules and regulations as excuses. We invented total quality management. We understand continuous and blah, 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 blah. After about 15 minutes, everybody's just glaring at me like this. I get to the end of my talk, forget applause. It is dead silent in that room. And now I'm a tad intimidated. So I go to walk off the stage, and there in the wings is the, the person who invited me, the superintendent, <laughs> is looking out, and as I'm walking up, he goes, no, no, Q&A, Q&A. <laughs> and I forgot that I was supposed to take questions. So I walked out, 
to the middle of the stage, and as soon as I got there, a woman's hand goes up. Actually, ma'am, right where you are. I looked at her. She appeared to be pleasant. <laughs> she was nicely done. I thought, I'll start with her. She'll be polite. I found out later she was a 27-year veteran high school English teacher who'd been laying in the bushes for me for about an hour. <laughs> she started out just as nice as you please. Mr. Palmer, we understand you make good ice cream. Well, I was insufferable in those days. Excuse me, ma'am. Best ice cream in America. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sir, she says. Something tells me it's rich and smooth. 17% butter fat, low overrun. Overruns the amount of air that you whip into to the mix to make it cheap. So you know you go to pick up the stuff that's now five or six dollars a pint and it's dense, and then you can pick up a tub and it weighs almost nothing. That's the overrun. Our overrun, very low. Something tells me, sir, you use nothing but all natural ingredients. Your nuts, your berries, your flavorings, they're all, whoa, 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 like it. I said, no, 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 yes, we use all natural. She said, they must all be like grade A ingredients and like an idiot. <laughs> I interrupted her. I said, no, no, no. At the Great Midwestern Ice Cream Company, our specification to the supplier is triple A. And a little smile shut across her face that I did not understand. She said, yes, sir, if you're walking through your factory and you come out onto your receiving dock and a shipment arrives, I don't know, a shipment of blueberries, and those blueberries do not meet your AAA standards, what do you do? And in the silence of that room, you could hear her trap snap. <laughs> I knew I was dead meat, but I wasn't going to lie. I said, ma'am, I would send them back. She springs to her feet. She shoves her finger towards me. She says, that's right. You would send them back. We can never send back the blueberries our suppliers send us. We take them big, small, rich, poor, hungry, abused, brilliant, creative, cautious, frightened, ADHD, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. English is their second language. We take them all, Mr. Vollmer, and that's why it's not a business, it's school. Well, <laughs> I would have gotten the point, but all 250 of them jump to their feet and start yelling, blueberries, Mal, blueberries. What did she show in 90 seconds? You have no control over the quality of the raw material. Zero. You take what the parents send and often give them over to you. I, I just heard this story. Sorry, I'm going off script. I heard this story not long ago. A superintendent in South Carolina, an acquaintance, um, he told the story. Now you have to see the vision. He's six foot four, a bean pole of a guy, six foot four, and he told a story of his first day as a teacher. He was 21 years old. He was teaching kindergarten. Just the juxtaposition of a six foot four man teaching kindergarten is funny, but it turns out you may have one of these next Monday. It turns out one of the little kids is completely out of control, totally unruly. This young man is right out of school. He's over his head instantly with this little boy. He survives the first day. He gets to the end and he goes to his principal and says, I got a kid who's bouncing off the wall. His principal says, settle down. It's the first day. They're all cranked up. It'll be fine. Second day, worse. <laughs> goes back to the principal, says, well, there's nothing for it. You're gonna have to talk to the parent. So he calls the mother that night and says, Mrs. Jones, this is your son's teacher, and I got to tell you, I'm struggling with this little boy. He's really pretty wound up, and the parent said to him, Mr. Jones, I had him all summer. Did I call you?
They're gonna show up on Monday, and some of them, you're not gonna be the only ones who teach them, you're gonna be the only ones who love them. Nobody else has a job like this. You are the most important professionals in the community, but you cannot do this alone. So, let's see what we're gonna to try to do to fix this. It took me a long time, by the way. I don't wanna say that after the blueberry lady, I was a changed man, I was not. Uh, not long after that, a superintendent invited me to come and be a, work in the district for a day. She had three requirements. Dress down, you don't have to suit up. No secretary calling you, no you calling your secretary. It's gonna be as though you worked with us for a day. And her third requirement was, once you arrive, you cannot leave. <laughs> so the first thing she made me do was be a teacher's aide in an elementary school, in a kindergarten. No, it's third grade, third grade. What's that mean for a six foot tall man? They're eight years old. That means bending over and standing up and bending over and standing up and trying to convince a little spaced out boy at the window, come on in here and join the group, son. <laughs> All morning long I did that. The lunch bell rings, the kids dutifully file out. I turn to the teacher, idiot. I turn to the teacher and say, come on, I'll buy you lunch downtown. <laughs> I'm gonna give a speech to a business group next week. That joke's gonna go right over their heads. <laughs> she says, yeah, we don't get out for lunch much around here. <laughs> it's been arranged that you're gonna dine in the building today. <laughs> Where'd they take me? I've been to the cafeteria dozens of times. It is always, even at my advanced age, it's a life-changing experience. <laughs> but that's not where they took me. Where'd they take me? Oh, dear Lord, the teacher's lounge. <laughs> you know, for the uninitiated, this is not a pretty sight. A bunch of grown-ups using 15 to 20 minutes to inhale food, gossip, and cut out paper pumpkins. <laughs> cut out paper. <laughs> not fine dining. So she has me doing playground duty, so I have to wolf down my lunch, and after I'm done supervising the playground, the last lunch bell rings, she comes, cool woman that the superintendent was, she makes me be a teacher's aide in an eighth grade classroom for the afternoon. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it was a warm Friday afternoon <laughs> in May. I will go to my grave with that smell <laughs> in my nostrils. It took a while for me to get from where I was to where I am, but I'm happy to have been here for a long time, and I've spent my entire career now focused on this one notion, the combination, the realization of this list as I gradually researched more and more and saw what it is America asks you to do every day and then criticizes you nonstop. You need allies. You cannot do this alone. So that's what we're gonna talk about. And I don't think... Down, thank you. Thank you, Tino, I would have thought it was up. You need to rally help. I am the guy who wrote the list. I know how busy you are. So it's not at this point, at this point, some of you may be thinking, Mayday, Mayday, he's gonna ask us to do something else. What I'm gonna ask you to do will add nothing to the list, but I need to have it in your awareness that you all are powerful. I will accent this. We gotta rally support, you need it. I mean, you needed it in the 90s, you needed it in the 2000s, in the 2020s. Yikes, how weird has it all become? You're ground zero for a lot of people in the culture war. You're gonna need help. You're gonna need people out there in the community who understand what you're up against and who support you. Hitting. So, I, you have nothing to do but read books that I recommend. But, 
I was more influenced by this book in the last decade than I think any other, uh, except the book I just read called Ministry for the Future, which is about climate change and scared the bejeepers out of me. But the point is, this guy, very bold, Yuval Harari, he writes a brief history of humankind. I don't want to get into a debate on when humankind started, but let's just say, regardless, he talks about the development of humankind, and the reason I bring it up here in this context is he makes the point that one of the things, one, don't come up and yell at me, one of the things that distinguishes human beings from everything else on the planet is that we tell stories. We tell stories to one another. And more importantly, for my purposes, we tell stories that we believe. So we tell stories that, for example, Michigan's better than Ohio. We believe that story. <laughs> I hate the Buckeyes. We believe stories. We believe stories that there is such a place called Michigan. I just flew out here. You don't see the lines. We made it up. It's a story. It's a fiction. We have all kinds of fictions that we believe in, and only human beings on the planet have that capacity. But why it's important in this context is that people believe stories whether or not they're true. So, those who tell the stories rule the society. And what I want to suggest is you got to tell your story. You got to tell your story because uh, this whole thing will not be gloomy, but there are a couple of kind of gloomy parts. There are hundreds, sadly, perhaps thousands of people in Michigan. There are hundreds of people in Midland who are telling a story about you that is a lie. They're telling you that you're not motivated, that you're more interested in your contract and your benefits than your kids, that you're lazy, that you don't think about kids in a serious way. You may say that nobody's thinking that baloney. They are. They absolutely, positively are. People are telling stories about you and public education generally, which other people are believing. Now, come Monday, ooh, I can't believe they're here on Monday. Come Monday, you are going to be swamped. If you listen, you can hear the pitter-patter of a million little feet come seven, how many kids, 7,500, something like that? 7,500, 15,000 feet. 15,000 feet are coming. You can hear them coming. You're going to be swamped. You're going to have a million things to do. Jamie Balmer's presentation will be swept under the tidal wave. But I'm hoping that you can have it in your awareness that while you're doing this, some, it's a cheap shot, but some guy here in Midland, sitting in front of computers, sitting in his drawers with a bag of chips open, is lying about you. It's just the fact these days. We have to tell our story. Public education is a miracle. I believe that in my heart. We are the first country on the, on the planet to have and aggressively pursue the concept of equal educational opportunity for all publicly funded. Even after 200 plus years, we don't live up to it all the time, but that's our goal, and it's a miracle. It has raised tens, hundreds of millions of human beings up in the world. Something's going to happen. Yes. I knew there was something. That's you. That's the truth. That's not the story. That's the truth. You take all the blueberries. We've already gone through that. No other institution does. You can't do it alone. You need to cultivate allies. You're going to need to have people with you in the trenches. You're going to need that. Again, some of you think, no, no, I don't need anybody. That's not true. You're going to need people out there defending you. 
when some loud mouth down at McDonald's starts spouting off about, oh, geez, here they are, they're all gathered. Those people are getting their pay today. They should be in the classroom with their kids. Why are they having some kind of an introduction award ceremony? I know that conversation took place this morning. I know it. You gotta strengthen your partnerships. You gotta increase involvement is what you might think I'm talking about, and I'm not. Because I spent most of the early 2000s, the late 90s and early 2000s, working with school districts trying to increase community involvement. And I'm telling you, it is a complete and total waste of time. You might think I've reached that conclusion because I was no good at it. I don't think so. Involvement is hard. Engagement we can do. Here's the difference. To involve is to induce participation. And what I have learned, even though it would be great, and I'm not talking about parents, by the way, we, know we need all the parental involvement we can get. I'm talking about this thing called community, public involvement. It would be wonderful. It would be a utopian society, but you're not gonna get it, and you're not gonna get it because Americans are dancing as fast as they can just to make their lives work. Everybody's busy. So I always recommend that the, it, you try to solicit involvement. I'll bet $1,000 it's in your strategic plan. It's in every strategic plan but it's just so difficult to do that it's depressing and is abandoned. Whereas, engage is to attract and hold favorable attention. And if the people in this room with the skill set that you have are not <laughs> capable of doing that, something is wrong. We can do this piece, we can get the public's attention and hold it because, as you will see, we have the best story. This is the most depressing statistic in my head. The vast majority of the people of Michigan have no children in school. They have no clue. But now let's connect some dots. People are out there telling a lie. They're telling a story that's not true. And if most of the people in the community don't have kids going to your school, then those people are susceptible to the lie. So we have to deal with the hand we've been dealt. This is the deal. They don't have kids. I don't know what the number is in Michigan, but most of the upper Midwest, the percentage of people who don't have children in school, the percentage of taxpayers who don't have children in school is above 75%. Think about that. There's a been there, done that attitude. Yeah, I paid for my kid. Yeah, I suppose I was willing to pay for my grandchildren some, but I don't want to pay for these kids. And we all know we don't like it, but there's a dirty little thread runs through that. I don't want to pay for some of these kids. They don't look like me. So we've got this outsized group of people who are disconnected. We're going to have to engage their attention and we're going to have them to tell a story. What we have found is that the public, that vast group especially, is moving away. There's a gap between schools and community. And in rapid fire succession, these are some of the reasons. I think this should work. Yeah, shifting demographics, negative media, stressed families, partisan politics, not in Michigan, misinformation, disinformation, international comparisons, bogus, changing families, anti-tax movements, violence in school, government intrusion, planning of America, I'll come back to that. And finally, COVID. These things have pushed the public away. That planning piece is a particular little bugaboo of mine. I was sent to school a long time ago and I sat in first grade and I was surrounded by purebreds. I'm kind of a mongrel when it comes to my, my mom is all Italian, my dad, who really knows? And so, I'm sitting with purebreds, Joey O'Hara, 
is sitting next to me. I can hardly understand Mrs. O'Hara. She's right off the boat from Dublin. Johnny Schmidt, the German's in front of me. Dieter Koletsky, the Pole, is next to me. And oh dear Lord, Lois Mariani. Those big brown eyes still haunt my dreams seven years later. <laughs> We were there to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic, but our parents depended upon the school so that we would all come out from our different backgrounds as Americans. That was essential. It's still an essential ingredient for public education. But you have parents in this town who are saying, I don't want my kid to be with them. And there's all kinds of thems. There's racial thems, ethnic thems, religious thems. Uh, economic thems, we don't want to be with them. And today, there's political thems, which is creepy. You melt, you put us all together, but if everybody's in their little tribe or clan, you got a problem. These are the things that push people apart. But to cultivate allies, turns out we tell our story and we have an ace. We actually have two, but we certainly have this one. The more people know about their schools, the more they like what they see. Ladies and gentlemen of Midland, please do not take that for granted. That is an absolute truth, as you will see in a second, but this is our ace. The more they know, the more they like, which leads you back to tell your story. This is a chart of the Americans, it's a national poll, the number, the percentage of people who give their schools uh, high marks, okay? It's actually, it's off the chart here. It's an A or a B. So the red line is the nation's schools. When you ask, basically, do you approve of the nation's public schools? It's pretty constant. And over the years, from 1974, you can't read it, to 2019, which as far as the graph goes, it is basically not rising much above 20%. And curiously, it's declining as we enter the last few years. This is the nation's schools. The blue line is your schools, your community schools. And you see you're doing better, but you still don't make it much past 50% at the peak. When the people are asked, what do you think about your schools, your public schools? But the green line is, what do you think about your kid's school? This is very important data, because not only do you get up to seven, above 70%, A or B, parents, uh, people in the community giving A or B to their schools, it's growing in the last years. The people who know you best like you the best. Here's another one. What do you think, percentage of public school parents very satisfied with their child's school? High school, yeah, 50 some percent. Middle school, getting the 60. Elementary school, over 70. Why? You, yes, thank you, they're more involved. Heaven knows a parent shows up at a high school campus, the kids would kill them. <laughs> But again, I, I don't want to be overbearing and maybe I'm putting, too, putting my thumb on the scale. This is important. The more they know, the more they like you. And it's not a popularity contest. With that like comes support, comes interest, comes understanding. This is your ace. If, if, if it weren't for that slide, I wouldn't be here today. I would be in despair in a fetal position someplace. This is the ace. The more they know, the more they're on your side. So, what are you gonna do? I, I'm gonna make a joke. What's, it's the Carpenter Preschool right down the road that I passed on Carpenter. I'm gonna make a joke. Is anybody here from there? Yeah, there you go. I'm gonna make a joke at your expense. <laughs> so, Almost every school has some kind of a marquee. This one here, Carpenter, while I was standing outside, you're electronic. Um, I, you, <laughs> what we find is that once June comes, late May, June, this is what's on your marquee. 
Although Carpenter, I, I'm not, it's not a joke, it's actually a compliment. Yours says, have a safe summer filled with smiles. <laughs> Nicely done. But I gotta tell you something. Hundreds, if not thousands of people drive by your signs. Have a safe summer. Have a great summer, it's fine for 10 days. Tell them stuff. Use this resource. It costs you nothing. And remember, I said, I'm not adding anything to the list. Well, I'm not really adding anything to the list now. Use the signs. Here's an example. How many meals does Midland Public Schools serve in the course of the year? Add it up. It's hundreds and hundreds of thousands probably over well over a million. And you go, yeah, it's no big deal. We're serving the meals. Nobody knows it. That's the thing. It's easy to marginalize you if they don't have a sense of how you contribute to the well-being, in this case, the nutrition of the children of this community. So that when somebody drives by that, some old guy my age wearing a seed cap and driving down the street and thinking he knows everything, he looks at that and he says, oh, I didn't know that. Boy, that is a priceless moment. That's priceless. You just gave him something to think about. And this is an incredibly valuable service. What about that? How many miles do your bus drivers travel? It's tens and tens of thousands when you add it all up. They are safely transporting the future of this community back and forth from home to school. Not only do you get this, you get a shout out to your bus drivers who deserve it. And it's simple. And people will say, wow, are you kidding me? That's a lot of miles. Well, it is. You teach more students in more subjects to higher levels in more creative and dynamic ways than ever before. And all the data supports that. All of it. You gotta tell them. Okay, so maybe there's a little bragging in that. Okay, you gotta get over that speed bump. You gotta speak up and talk about the job that you're doing. Here's one I just got. Thanks to the custodians, over 500,000 square feet cleaned weekly. This is, this is not a big district. This is outside uh, San Antonio. Like, kinda like this in, in size. So, again, it's easy to marginalize what you are unfamiliar with. And that's the danger, because if you be continue to be marginalized, 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 you get some idiot in Lansing saying, let's defund public education. Let's cut the budget again. This is not important. Let's open it all up to choice. No, that's not Lansing, that's Holland. Never mind. <laughs> Cultivate allies. If public education breaks apart, America breaks down. You're the last great institution holding us all together. You gotta cultivate allies. So what else can we do? We can use our marquees. Come on. You already have the letters. You can use them. <laughs> There's another thing we can do. We can, you all know what an employee of the month is. You just did a wonderful job, and congratulations to all the recipients. That was really very impressive. Nice job. But I created the employer of the month. Once a month, obviously with security concerns and all the other background checks and everything else, you bring in an employer from the community and do what that mean lady did to me all those years ago. I don't want to talk about some VIP hands in their pocket walking tour. Oh, computers, aren't they fascinating? Get them to do the work. Nobody can have the experience that I had and walk out unchanged. They could be dead. <laughs> but it's very difficult. I remember asking that superintendent at the end of the day. The last bell rang. I had not stood on my feet for a whole day for decades, and so the muscles behind my shin bones, they ached. The small of my back was killing me. My brain at the end of the day was screaming for Advil and caffeine, and I would not have turned down a beaker full of gin. <laughs> and I asked that superintendent, is what I just saw typical? 
And she said, for 90% of my staff, 90% of the time, you work incredibly hard. I would argue, let bring people who can be your allies and have, for whatever reason, an outsized voice in the community, let them see it. Let them get in there and see it. Tell your story. You gotta, even if it's just over the, in the driveway with your loud mouth idiot neighbor, whatever. Everyday evidence, this is another thing we can do. Uh, this was actually invented. Do you know Mike Paskowitz? Did you know Mike Paskowitz? This was invented by Mike. Mike is retired. He was a superintendent above, um, what, Grand, what's the Grand Rapids? Um, and I said to him, Mike, I can't go out there and talk about this if this takes a lot of time. He says, no, once you get it down, it's about 30, 30 minutes, maybe once or twice a week. And what everyday evidence is, is a district-wide crowdsourcing approach to closing the engagement gap. In other words, you're the crowd. And how this works is, and I don't want to give this mic more work to do, I'm just throwing it out as an idea, that uh, the superintendent says, I want all of you, I'm kind of doing it right now, I guess, I want all of you, when school starts, to pay attention to anything that you see that's going right. Any step of progress, any little success story, it doesn't have to be hand of God through the clouds, rainbows in the air, miracles. Small steps of progress. If you see anything, let me know. And so Mike told him, the, his staff, this, and at first, almost everybody ignored him, but then a couple people started sending them emails. I saw this, I saw that, and Mike did a really smart thing. He reduced your overly verbose email to a very short little paragraph describing what had taken place, and he typed it up, and then he sent it to the governor and every elected official in his district area. And then, in what I thought was a brilliant kind of sleight of hand, he sent it to you, the staff. He copied you on his message to the governor, which is kind of interesting. Oh, look what Mike just said to the governor. And then pretty soon, parents got wind of it, so they wanted to be included. And then a miracle occurred that he did not anticipate. Parents and grandparents were taking these little everyday signs of success, they took it and they sent it to the governor. Now it's one thing for a politician to get an email from Mike. It's another thing to get it from a parent, a grandparent, or a donor. This started to work. And pretty soon, the governor did not go to Mike's district, but somebody from the staff did. And then people locally, city council, they started showing up because it just went on. It was a way to tell the story. Oh, I, I see, I, I took it out, sorry. So, examples of this. For example, again, not miracles. Somebody saw a custodian helping a kindergartner find a shoe. Where the shoe went, I have no idea. But the custodian helped. That was written up. I'm just showing you, it does not have to be. I got five National Merit finalists in my classroom. Uh, somebody talked about a s s uh, special education teacher who held a pre-prom dance session for his students so that they would be a little bit more comfortable at prom. A teacher, a basketball coach, had his, no, her, her team, girls basketball, women's basketball? She had a female basketball team. <laughs> you gotta be careful. <laughs> and they made Christmas baskets for the senior center. These things were just reported. It is part and parcel. You're not just reading out of the textbook and teaching them strictly according to the curriculum. You're making their lives. And so it began to be reported and it began to flood, and pretty soon the whole community began to be aware of everyday evidence. Tell your story. This is a problem you're gonna have. I don't know why all the guys who say this are wearing a funny hat. <laughs> it's okay for me, it'll be okay for these kids. This is one of the things, when you think about all the people who don't have kids in school anymore, they all think it used to be better. All of them. 
I talked to a guy not that some standing in a grocery line this summer and asked what I did and I kind of told him, he goes, oh, you know what? They, they got these problems with gra graduating. I mean, you know, everybody I graduated with graduated. <laughs> That's their mindset, that they don't understand what the reality is. By the way, your dropout rate, your graduation rate is higher than it's ever been. That's true here, it's true nationally. You've never done a better job. And when that, by the way, that guy was at least 10 years older than I am, when he graduated from high school in the United States of America, the dropout rate was 40%. But he thinks it used to be better. That's what he thinks. He is a victim of nostesia. <laughs> I want you to say it after me. Nostesia. Yeah, nostesia. Nostesia. 50% nostalgia, 50% amnesia. <laughs> Nostesia. It's out there, and one of the ways we fight that, this is what they think real school looks like, by the way. That's what real school looks like. You will run up against this group of thinks, you know, let's just go back to the way it was. We don't need change. That ain't the way we do it around here. It's everywhere in America. Read them the list. You, you can get the copies of the list in the word format. It's all over the net. Read them the list. Let them see. I think the list that I started out with should be on every refrigerator door in Midland. I think they should see when they reach for the orange juice or the milk in the morning. This is what they, not you, your organizations fought most of these line items. You did not want to be raising America's kids. They. The people of Michigan have pushed this responsibility on you and they don't know it. And then they complain about it. Why aren't you just teaching this? So, we're getting towards the end. This is something you can all do. It doesn't add anything to the list. You can all do this, all of you. The five S's. You can do this because you are one of, this is probably true, isn't it? One of the, are you the largest employer? One of certainly one of the largest employee groups in Midland. You have power. You have power. First thing we have to do under the five S's, don't mean to be a scold, you have to stop. You have to stop bad-mouthing one another in your schools in public. This is very corrosive. The teacher who stands in the checkout line ripping another teacher or a principal or worse, a kid, spreads his or her negativity through that checkout line like a virus. And everybody who hears it catches that. And what do we do? We're just human beings. We repeat it. This is the perfect lose-lose moment. They think less of you and they wind up thinking less of the schools. You gotta stop that. I'm not asking you to be martyrs. I know what you do is hard. Sometimes you're just gonna wanna gripe. Fine, you have my permission, gripe. But gripe to your spouse, that's why we have them. <laughs> Keep it out of the public. This really hurts us. The second thing we do is have to shift our attention from the negative to the positive. This is the one thing I've learned about how the universe works. What you put, put your attention on grows stronger in your life. If you start out today or Monday and you start focusing on every little negative thing that goes on inside your classroom, your hallway, your building, this district, come May, only one thing will have changed. You will be more negative. We got a lot of research on this. And now neurophysiology has strengthened my argument because neurophysiology now has proven that the more a human being focuses on the negative, the more they compromise their immune system. I don't know how that works, but that seems to be the fact. You have less energy. You feel worse about yourself. Your interpersonal relationships gradually degrade, all because you're focusing on the negative. So what I'm asking you to do now is simply entertain the notion of a behavior modification, a shift, just a shift. Focus on what's going right instead of what's going wrong. 
And if, you, if you're having trouble, uh, do it, find a buddy. Find a little positivity buddy <laughs> who will help you in those moments when you want to go down that negative path. And high school people, since they're none in your building, look in the elementary school. That's where you find them all. <laughs> this is just a, a repetition of the theme. You got to tell your story. You have to share what's going right. Share it. And by the way, you all have power. You just share it inside your own network of family, friends, neighbors, because you are so large and because you're all so capable in your jobs, pretty soon you have ripples of positivity flowing across this entire community. Just by saying stuff to your family, friends, and neighbors. It's not an onerous responsibility. The fourth S is once we begin, sustain the effort. Keep it up. Ask yourselves, maybe once every Sunday night, how many positive things did I say about my job, my kids, whatever it is you're doing for the district, you all have a very powerful role. How many positive things did I say about it this week? Oh, I don't know. Three. Fine, three. No judgment. Maybe next week you go to four. This is like pennies in a jar, and there's so many of you that the pennies add up. And finally, start now. We've come to a very strange place in America. We don't have to talk about that at length, but it's odd. It's a strange place, and now's the time to start this conversation. You have an ace. The more they know, the more they like you. You have the power to share that, and you got another ace. Public education works. It does. It works every single day. We share this story, you create more allies. You get more appreciation, more respect, more partners, imagine on Monday, more kids ready to learn, and more resources, all because you tell your story, because you can't do it alone. I can't tell you, this is the first time I've done it this year, it's really exciting for me every single year to start the year. I hope you have a spectacular school year. God bless you. Jamie, you may or may not know, I always tell baseball acronyms in there, so I'll tell one right now. I think you just hit a home run, at least from my point of view, so thank you very much. You know, I, I only knew a little bit of what Jamie was going to do today when I was looking for a speaker last spring, and, um, you know, obviously you picked up that we're better together, and that was part of my theme, and, you know, I'm getting to be an old guy in the room, and I've been doing this a long time, and so when I say us and them, it's got to stop, guys. I'm not going to be here much longer, but we have to stop that. We're so much better together, and we're being attacked everywhere, guys. If you watched any of our board meetings, I'm a pretty tough kind of guy, but the, if we don't do get together, there are those in the community that want to destroy us. And I, I tell my inner team every year, we do great things. I've worked in six different districts. I've worked in two different states. I was asked to come here from another district where I first told them no until I learned about Midland Public. I recruited Brian to bring him, bring him here, and how I did it was I showed him the opportunity for his kids, and he was, he was willing to come here. We do a great job every day, and don't forget to tell our story. When I arrived 10 years ago, you had just failed the millage. First time in Midland history, you had lost a sinking fund and a bond on it. Mark knows district had just gone through tough times, closed five school buildings. There wasn't good labor relations between the employee groups. That story got out in the community. At that time, Jamie, I created something called a communique. I actually really should give Cindy Young credit. I created the idea of it and Cindy grew it. As you all know, she did most of the work down there for me. <laughs> um, that communique goes to 20,000 emails every Monday. We need to tell our story. I can't fill it up. You guys have the stories that we need to tell for the negative Nellies to stop telling the story that what we're doing and not doing. So 
Hope you picked up on that message, and I think it's going to be a great year. We're past COVID. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. We're going to move on. I know it's still there, and we'll make sure we're ready. But we'll, get, we'll keep moving on. So have a great rest of your day, and I'm really looking forward to the school year. Thank you very much.